if you ache for truth, goodness, and beauty. If you're hungry for a Christianity with substance and strength. If you long for a faith that's big and bold and biblical and all about Jesus Christ. If you're inspired by the idea of one church that has spanned 20 centuries, 24 time zones, and two hemispheres, enfolding every race, nation, and language, then you're considering Catholicism. Well, welcome to the podcast, and Ed and I, this is Ed the Protestant. Say hi, Ed. I'm hi. I'm Ed the Protestant. Ed, for those of you who are regular listeners or not, Ed is uh, my good friend. He's a he is a Protestant who is considering Catholicism and a frequent uh, guest here on the podcast. So uh, before we launch into today's topic, uh, just a little word about what's going on for the summer. So some of you may have noticed that we haven't posted any episodes for a couple of weeks, and I want to explain why. Uh, we generally have about a four to six week pipeline. So in other words, the episodes that we're recording on any given week will air four to six weeks out. That gives us time for editing and things like that. Well, frankly, uh, as we got into late April and May, uh, we had a, a fewer opportunities to record and we sort of uh, ate into our pipeline. We sort of used up our inventory of episodes. Right. And when Memorial Day came, uh, I had some vacation time scheduled uh, with my family, as did Ed. Um, it's been, you know, we've been recording for for a year and a half, almost 150 episodes, and um, we just needed a little bit of a break. So I went away for a couple of weeks uh, with my wife, and Ed went away for a couple of weeks with his wife, and Corey spent some time with his family, and, you know, a bunch of things like that. Anyway, we're back, and we're catching up, and we're recording again, and we are uh, it is now, as we sit here, it is the longest day of the year, is the summer solstice, and we're sitting out here in the piney woods, the secret compound on the shore of the Great Lakes. And it's hot. And it is a hot day, uh, but uh, we're back at it, and we're going to have a little bit of a summer schedule because we want to get caught up on recording and episodes, and because... Frankly, it's the next eight weeks is an opportunity for all of us to maybe kind of refresh and regroup and spend time with our families and enjoy the summer a little bit. We, for the last year and a half, have done published two episodes a week, but between now and Labor Day, um, we're going to go to one episode a week as sort of a summer schedule. And I know that you all are out there, uh, have a lot of things going on in your lives and enjoying the summer, so uh, a few less episodes, uh, but we'll, uh, we'll resume the full normal schedule once we get uh, past Labor Day. That being said, Ed and I went out for Mexican lunch today before we recorded, as is our as is proper long yeah, proper yep. our longstanding. Uh, it is right and just, and as our longstanding right. practice. And while we were uh, having uh, lunch, Ed had the taco special, and I had the enchilada special at the little Mexican diner we go to. He was sharing <laughs> some interesting stories and thoughts about sort of his evangelical experience of going to church on yeah. Sunday uh, versus, you know, sort of the Catholic experience of going to church. And it conversation was pretty interesting. So when we finished and we drove over here to the secret compound, I, I said to Ed, you know, whatever else we were going to record today, we, we need to sort of recreate that conversation, you know, here for yeah. the listeners. So I'm going to let Ed lead off and, and share what he shared and kind of, we'll, we'll see where it goes. Yeah, I, um, there's a, a big church here in the Lakeshore area, evangelical church that, that I uh, attend with my wife and I play in the band once in a while. And my friend, a friend of mine runs the band. He's the worship director, one of the worship directors. It's a big place. They have multiple services. They have a conventional service and a, you know, a youthful service and whatever. And, uh, he's in charge of two of them and it's, it's a lot of work. And, uh, he, he wants to take vacation and I don't blame him. So he's out on a cruise and he hires me to come in and do his job. And I used to do this job. So I know the ropes and it's easy and I can fall right back into it. But what is the job? Exactly. Are you, are okay. You well, okay. So, so there are, there are two, two, two services and there we need, uh, to play worship songs. Okay. So there are probably a total of with a, there's a prelude song, an instrumental song. The band has a little fun, plays, plays a song. And then there are 
There's a song up front, then there's three more before the sermon, then there's one after. So there's five okay, but songs. For our, for our listeners who are Catholics that don't know what an evangelical band is, describe so, okay, it. So give some it's, context. It's, to a, this. it's you know, think, think of a rock band. There's a drums and bass and guitars and keyboards and singers. And I'm, uh, it's my name they call if it doesn't sound good. Um, if and, it there's does, a, and there's a drummer in a big plastic hermetically sealed right, box. which is which is where my i think was where my rant started yeah uh, <laughs> at lunch um so oh, and there's there's lights and yeah the, there's, lights fog and, machine. there's lights and yeah no fog machine thankfully it makes my throat raw but anyway um it's sugar water did you know that the fog mm-hmm. anyway so there's a lot to do and it's very busy and i i get there early in the morning and we set up there's like sound equipment set up and there's there's a tech team. There's these there's a guy in charge, and there's all these young kids who work volunteer under him. And there's a PA system in the gym, and we do a service there. And then we tear down the instruments, not the PA system, and we hustle across the hall into the big auditorium where the second service is, the later service. And that's and we have to very quickly, very quickly plug in, get a sound check, and go. And it's it's a big push, and they paid me well for it. So uh, you know, happy to do the job. But it was particularly trying this last time because we had tech issue after tech issue. And I began to feel like, so by the time we were done with it, I, I, was, I was really played out, right? I was spent. I was ready to go home and, and take a nap. And there were some frustrations and there were... Uh, uh, I got kind of angry during one under one for one reason. And, uh, and I started thinking and there's the, you know, so there's a drum, they, they, there's a drum booth because somebody complained about the drums being too loud in the service after all these years they've been doing it. And so they built this thing that looks like a terrarium and the drummer is completely utterly closed off from, you can see him, but you can't talk to him because you can't shout loud enough to get through the plexiglass and it's, it's got a top on it, and they literally have an air filtration system to keep air, an air system to keep air moving through there. Because if you sat in there for an hour, you could breathe up all the air, and the air can't get in or out. He's Bubble Boy. He's Bubble Boy. It's that tight. <laughs> and so that added a layer of, for, uh, I'm sorry, a little inside baseball here, short story. Um, I, everybody controls the volume of their own monitors, and you need a monitor when you're up there playing. So I have little 16 little dials that I can use to dial in how much of everybody I'm going to get. But now the drums... Instead of hearing them right next to me, I have to dial in how much of the kick drum and the snare drum and the hi-hats and the cymbals and the toms, and there's just no time for it. And that was piled on top of other things. And I was, I got all done with it, and they liked what I did, and it's all fine, you know. But I started wondering if it was doing anybody any good. Is this any, does this help? I mean, what's, uh, what's the point? of showing up on Sunday morning. What does it do for me? And this was such a good conversation we had, so I hope we can get it all back out uh, uh, into the mics here. But what is the point? What is the purpose? Why am I here? Did, Did the people sitting out in the pews and the chairs, stackable chairs, did they walk away better Christians? That's... So, so as we were talking about it, we thought about like this kind of cost value curve, right? So you have 10 people between musicians and tech people and everything else with tens or tens and tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment and all this, you know, hundred grand worth of equipment sitting up there and all this complicated stuff that's going on. And there's these arguments and fights over whether the hi-hat symbol is too loud and monitor number four right? and all this. And if, and in a sense, if the rock band doesn't nail it, and if the bass track and the, you know, keyboard thing isn't, you know, balanced exactly, and if the guy's snare or his kick drum isn't exactly right, then somehow, uh, you know, the, the service failed and failed to reach people for Jesus. Right. And, and, you know, you sit there and you wonder, well, here's Joe and Mary Blow who are sitting in right. row 14. And do they go, you know, I, I, I really want to believe in Jesus and go to heaven. But man, the, the the snare drum today just was a little off, you know, right. in the mix, and I'm I'm giving up on Christ, you know, right? right? So so there was a sense in which, and this is where we kind of went with it, was because I remember those, you know, I remember spending thirty years in that world, right? 
and how everything was was layered with this sense of just heavy with this sense of we have to do this right and elaborately and everything else. Otherwise, people won't hear the message and get the point and be saved or something. Right. Right. Or something. And so for those of you or those who worked in it, it was this enormous sense of duty to the, 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 it's almost like the more elaborate that we make the rock band and everything yeah. else, the more somehow we'll accomplish the mission of the service. Right. When, yeah, yeah I, I, you know, I lived in that world for uh, quite a while and the push was every week we had to come up with something compelling. Every week we had to come up with something that would reach out to people and convince them and move them and all these things. And I ended up getting out of it because I just burned out on it. I just, you know, I had no more, I don't have any more ideas left. I couldn't, I couldn't take that. And so here I am up front doing this and I don't have any uh, we're near that kind of it's not my job it's not my gig it's not my thing it's right I'm just I'm just in fact I just sang the songs that he told me to do so it's it was easy right right but as we talked at lunch you know part of it came is two things that I want to explore one is this this sense of mission and obligation on the people who you know work in the church right but the other thing is what it raises this question of why do people come to church on Sunday in the first right. place what's the per point and so if the point is, if unless we do this the right way, right. then Joe and Mary sitting in row 14, somehow like the mission won't be accomplished with them. Right. Right. And it'll have been pointless for them to come or we will have frustrated the God's purposes with them because we didn't, you know, do this right. elaborate thing. And, and so you and I, you were talking about the contrast between that and and, and yeah. Catholicism in terms of what's the, why do we show up at the mass? Well, this brought me back to, as I was thinking about it all, it brought me back to something you said in a, in a podcast a while back. I wasn't one that I was in. It was you and Corey, I think. And you were talking about how the, the point, the, the, our purpose, the, the purpose that we were created for was to be in community with God is to walk with God, be in his presence, be in community. And that being in community with God would make us happy. But if we, if we uh, started out with happiness as the end, then maybe we could commune with God or maybe not, but the point is to be happy. So maybe if it makes me happy to, to, uh, to play golf, then maybe I should do that. So um, that led me to th us to talking about and me to thinking about why do I... What's the point of me going to church and what do I, because all my life, the thing that everybody said was, well, what did you get out of it today? Right. What did I get out of it? As if, and this is a fairly new thought for me, the church was, service was there to serve me. To give you something. To give me something, to serve me. So, so it's that framing of when you say, what did you get out of church today? Because that's, yeah. Right. So often that was the question. I mean, I remember even when I was a young evangelical pastor and I had little kids and we'd come home and I'd ask the kids at lunch. So what did you get out of church today? As right. if they're supposed to get something out of it or our thing is to give them something. I mean, the, it, it's as if, as you're saying, the going to church is a means to an end. Right. Right. And the, that end is often... Um, we're supposed to learn something, we're supposed to get motivated, we're supposed to make friends, we're supposed to be entertained, we're supposed to get equipped to go out and do mission, we're supposed to learn more about the Bible, whatever the case is, right? Right. And so the, the church service or the worship service or whatever you want to call it, the Sunday program, right. often it was called that, is there as a functional delivery system right for whatever these values or 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 uh practical benefits right and the question is is if i get enough out of the service then it was worth it for me to go right and it becomes enormously exhausting obviously <laughs> yes. for the people who work in that to keep right. asking 
did we deliver enough to the customers in a sense? It's exhausting to be the to be the consumer. But then yeah, but then it's exhausting to be the person coming and going, what am I supposed to get out of this today? And then asking yourself, I didn't get anything out of it. Am I a so bad why, person? Well, or why did I bother to go? Right. Maybe I should find somewhere else that I would get more out of. And right. that's where you get consumer mm-hmm. church where I go, well, we're going to drive to this other church because I get more out of that one. Right. So it's the framing of all that. And, and as you and I were talking at lunch and in our previous conversations, you know, I contrast that with the Catholic mass mm-hmm. because we've talked about what the purpose of the mass is, right? So the purpose of the mass is for us to encounter Christ. Just that's it. Right. To meet Christ. And, and we do that in, and right, and so the the liturgy of the word and the first half of the mass, yep. and the second half, the, the, the you know the, the liturgy of the Eucharist, right, yep. which is the word made incarnate, right, and and so what we do is we simply show up and meet him because the end of life is simply to meet him. Yes, that so it isn't as if by meeting Christ that advances that's a means to some more practical goal in my life happiness, knowledge, utility, mission programs. Right. It's simply to meet him because what else is the goal in life? You know, when, when our life is over, right? Catholicism teaches us, we're going to, you know, experience the beatific vision. We're going to go, you know, stand before him. In a sense, we've been separated from him. And, and so in the mass, which is in a sense, a recreation of the worship service in heaven, Right. Right. We, that's in a sense being reenacted or, or brought down to earth. Right. And then we encounter him in, in, in the very real way of taking his body and blood. Right. Right. That's the point. There is no other point beyond that. Now it's nice if the homily was good and I learned something in the homily or I was, the homily was motivational or touched me. It's nice if the choir or the musicians or the cantor did a really nice piece of music and right. it was enjoyable or moving, but, but that's not the point. That's sort of a, maybe a benefit. Right. But if I go to a mass and the homily is just sort of predictable and right. not very, somewhat dull. Or if the musician is off key and the songs are just so-so, it doesn't diminish the point of me being there, which is to go encounter Christ in the word and in his body and blood. Your, when we did the seven capital sins, you talked about the first one being uh, pride, right? And it was that we used the chocolate fountain as an analogy. Right. Uh, so for, uh, uh, stick with me here because these are sort of new thoughts for me. Communing with God, touching God, being in contact with God is the top of the chocolate fountain. Yes. If I want to be happy or, or be more, uh, moved along the holiness continuum, be more sanctified, be made more like Christ, all of that, all of that runs from, stems from, starts from communion with God, which is the mass. Okay. I, we were, I was sitting with talking, talking with a woman who was saying that she knew a young girl who was, had grown up Catholic, but now she was coming to a Protestant church and she had learned so much about Jesus. Whereas the Catholic church just told her to do these things. And I went away from that thinking, okay, if I learn a bunch of stuff which I've been doing all my life. How does that make me better? Does that, does that make me better? Because if just knowing things, knowledge led to me being better, there would be no people, uh, there would be no smokers and no, nobody would be overweight because everybody knows those things are bad for you, but people still are. You know, you, you bring back that thing that we talked about during the seven, about the seven deadly sins with you know, our analogy of, that the, the top of the chocolate fountain is pride, right? right? It's, the, it's the sin from which all the other sins, um, you know, uh, that out of that sin, all the other sins flow down, right? Right. So, 
so if you think about that, if the purpose of life, the ultimate purpose is to simply encounter Christ and have him, the beatific vision, have him fill our eyes and our heart, right? Mm -hmm. Then that makes sense that pride would be uh, the thing at the top as well. Mm -hmm. Because pride is substituting our own good and our own will and our own priorities, right? It's putting ourselves at the center instead of God. And there is a sort of pride, not a sort of pride, it is pride to say, and sort of hubris, to come and say, what am I going to get out of church today? Right. Is the pastor going to hold my interest and teach me something new? Because if he doesn't, then he sort of, you know, failed to right. enrich me today. Is the, was the band in, you know, playing, you know, whatever praise and worship songs or praying a U2 song or whatever they're doing, right? right? Were they hot? And, you know, right, was the band hot today? Because if the band was just kind of flat, then they didn't do whatever I need to be done for me. Did I? So as you go down this list now, then what you're really doing is you're making, right? You're just making it about you and not about Christ. So, so I had a, I had an experience recently. I, uh, we were traveling and, um, I went to mass. My wife and I went to mass on Sunday morning. And I, my, my confession is that, well, well we, we had a little uh, play date in the afternoon. She and I were going to go out and play nine holes of golf together. So a little right. couple, couple thing in the, uh, in the afternoon, like four o'clock. So we come out of mass and we get in the car. And um, as we're pulling out of the church parking lot, I said, so, so what are you thinking about for dinner tonight? You know, after we get home from golf. And she's like, I don't know, what, what, what do you think? And I said, well, I, as a matter of fact, I have to confess that I thought about it a lot during mass. Because, <laughs> right. Because during the 13 minute homily, I, I, I didn't <clears throat> think the homily was, you know, particularly interesting today. Right. Um, you know, sorry, right. um, father, but I didn't think today's homily was particularly interesting. And I found myself thinking about what I wanted for dinner. And, right. um, you know, and uh, the, the music was okay today, but we had sit over on the side so we could just kind of get out. Right. Now, here's my point. If I had come to there going, I have to get something from this. I have to right. learn something. I have to be entertained. I have to meet three new people. I have to do this to have made it worth it for me to go. Then it was a total failure. I failed. Church failed. Right. But at the end, that wasn't why I went. I went because it is right and just right. for me as a creature and as a follower of Christ to come and experience and, and right and engage in the sacred worship, mm-hmm. right? And, and to receive uh, the Eucharist. Yeah. Um, and it is right and just and healthy for me to do that. Whether or not I found it particularly interesting that day or not right it was where i belonged and you know i remember having a really hard time explaining this and i know that some of our listeners have this because you've undoubtedly got kids once they become teenagers or maybe even after they go off to college or you know become you know college after graduate from high school or whatever and they don't go to church anymore and you say you know you need to go to church and they'll say why do i need to go to church and you say Right. Think, rehearse all the things you say. Well, it's really good because, um, you know, you'll get, you'll get kind of, you know, uh, immersed in the word and you'll learn something or you'll say it's good to be with, you know, God's people or to meet some people or to see some your right. friends in Jesus. Yeah. Or you'll say it was, oh, it's so great to be there. It's so uplifting because the music is so great or the pastor is really interesting or what, right? And so again, you're always trying to sell them on, in a sense, the benefits, what they're going to get out of it. Right. And the truth is, is that I'm not going to get anything. I might get some things out of it, but that's not the point. The point is not what I'm going to get out of it, but simply that I be there. Yeah. You know, um, I was thinking about this recently with respect to people who are, are like in the hospital and they're, or in, um, a hospice and they're dying. Yep. Right. And, you know, friends and relatives show up or maybe at the funeral visitation. And, you know, you're going to have people who, who, who come to what, pay their respects. 
Yep. And you go, they don't know what to say. You know, right. they don't, they don't know what to do. They can't say something that makes it better. Right. But if I'm lying on my, you know, on my deathbed, literally right. in the hospice, the fact that they came. Right. That they were there. Yep. You know, and, and there's a sort of just a point to it, whether they got something out of it or I got something out of it, they were there. It's where right. you belonged. And I, and I think that that's, for me, be, you know, converting to Catholicism, it's been transformative. Now, there are times when the pastor has or the priest has an amazing homily and I really learned a lot, or there are times when the choir was particularly great or whatever, right. but, but, but I'm, I'm there because that's where I belong. Yes. And as a, and as a follow, as a, as a part of Christ's body, I am united to him in the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the, the Eucharist and in the sacrament and, and in a sense, my life revolves or orbits around that, that the frequency, that frequent right. engagement with him. And, you know, so it, it's really, really liberating for me to, to go. And it's also been, I think, liberating for me to not feel as somebody who works in the church that I have to come up with elaborate stuff to deliver perceived value to the consumers. Right. I. This, this thought, I've been, it, the, these thoughts have become more fully formed in me today as we were eating tacos, because I've, I've been thinking about all these things. And of course, I understood si since last year when I started doing this with you that, that the, the Catholic Mass is nothing like a, a Protestant church service, just nothing like it. Maybe a little bit on the outside looking in, but it really isn't. But if, if. If I am to think of my church attendance, my going to mass, th the way we've just been describing, this changes the entire landscape of my approach to church. This entire, I can, I can, this feels very liberating to me. Like I could drop off the feeling that I went to church, but I'm a bad Christian because I didn't, as we've been saying, get anything out of it. Like I didn't feel anything or I didn't learn anything or I didn't take notes. Um, and now I need to go listen to the sermon again on tape because I, you know, or whatever, um, be, uh, this, this is, this feels utterly liberating to me. Right? We were, um, that was like a year ago, we, we were traveling, um, and we were on one of the islands in the upper Great Lakes. Yep. We won't say which one, but we were, we were kind of vacationing on this island for a week. And it's a, it's a little tiny Catholic church on this island and it doesn't have a full-time priest because it's not big enough. Right. And so what it is, is there's, there's like a priest that has like four or five churches scattered on these islands and or on the mainland and they have right. great lakes there. And he literally like at different days of the week <laughs> takes like a ferry yeah. or a boat out to them and does a mass. Um, and there's like a summer schedule and a winter schedule and all that. And so we were there and I remember that we had, you know, done a lot of actor, actor activities that way yep. that day. And for whatever reason, the mass that the priest who was coming over to the island was going to be there to do was like at four o'clock on a Wednesday or something like that. Right. And, you know, we'd done a bunch of outdoor activities. I'm like, I'm super tired and I've been in the sun all day and we've been in the water and, right. you know, had a great, great day. And it's like, ah, but there's the only chance to go to mass this week is right. to drive over to this little tiny, you know, mission chapel thing. Right. Uh, and I remember that the priest was like from Slovakia or something and he had this right. accent. But, you know, I kind of, you know, cleaned myself up, put right. on a fresh pair of jeans and a, you know, and a, and a shirt or something. And, 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 and we drove over there and, you know, and did mass. Right. You know, went to the mass and came back. And, you know, in my Protestant days, and I still have, you know, evangelical friends would say, this is terribly this sense of obligation. Like you had to go get your, ticket right. punched and it's like right. all the things you have to do and I go well that was like what was freeing about it I knew that what God was was fitting for me to, was to go and meet right. Christ and take his body and blood and encounter him in the, the liturgy of right. the word and, sac and the sacrament that was fitting and right and, and what he wants me to do you know right. this week and as tired as I was and everything else it was fitting and right and quite I don't know liberating yeah. to go and go okay 
I went and met God, just like you might say, I went and visited my sick grandma uh, in the nursing home this week because it's the right thing to do. And it feels good to have done the right thing. Yeah. And, and, and now I'm going to go back to the place where we were staying and, and, you know, relax. And, and, uh, I, you know, there may be evangelicals out there just find this horrifying, like, you know, you know, you're, you're supposed to go there and it's supposed to be meaningful. And if it wasn't meaningful, then it's not real. And I go, but it was meaningful in the same way. Like I said, going in, I remember my, uh, wife had a grandfather who was in a nursing home for a number of years before he passed. And, you know, he had dementia in his later years and he wasn't quite sure who we were. Right. You know, so it always struck me that like, we don't actually have to come here right. to visit him in the afternoon because he wouldn't remember whether he wouldn't right. be able to tell anybody that we didn't come because it was like, Hey, you right. know, I think it was like Frank from 40 years ago or whatever. He always called me by the wrong name. Right. But it, that wasn't the point. The point was it was the right thing for us to, to go and to be there. And it was a good right. thing for us to go and be there. And so we went. Yeah. And I, I don't know. It's it's really been a transformative thing for me to think about faith and think about uh, Christianity and think about church and going to church in those different terms. When I look back over my life as a Protestant, I realized that I have been chasing and chasing and chasing. And I would really like to not do that anymore. I, I, I want, because of the way I see the church service, I want the most out of it, which leads me to trying to find the place where I can get the most out of it, which leads me to thinking, well, maybe if I, if I go someplace where I like the music better or I like the teaching better, or they have better coffee and on and on and on and on and on. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm just exhausted from all the chasing personally, and I'm exhausted from participating in all of, all of that. Uh, and I, it just occurred to me when you and Corey were talking in just the last podcast before this one about community. And I realized that another new thought for me at my age, look at that. That the church was basically ex- would be expecting me, the Catholic Church, to go to mass at the nearest location. Mm-hmm. That's where I belong. And I thought, oh, that's another choice they just took out of my hands. Right. Which is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, I remember when, you know, I decided to, you know, take a, the, the, fine, the step for the Catholic Church. And I'd, I'd spent, right. you know, 15, 20 years sort of researching and investigating. And so I felt like actually pretty knowledgeable in some ways about Catholicism, at least history right. and theology and doctrine and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I traveled the world and gone to the great cathedrals and yeah, blah, 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 blah. But, uh, but when it came time to go, you know, I'm, I'm ready to, you know, take right. the step and go walk into the front door of the Catholic church and say, I'm here to become a Catholic. You know, I remember thinking, well, okay, what churches are within an hour radius <laughs> and there's like this really beautiful basilica right. about 35 minutes from here with like, you know, this just yeah. gorgeous architecture and You art. took me there. It's, yeah. I, no, I took you to the cathedral, oh, which okay. is very beautiful. And there's also a, the cathedral is beautiful and there's also a basilica that in, in, in uh, near, near, not far from there, that it's right. really okay. even more beautiful and elaborate. And I remember going, well, you know, we should go to something like that because you know, that would... That would really, you know, fulfill all right. the feelings I have about Catholicism and the history and the art and the truth, right. goodness and beauty and blah, 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 blah. But I remember going, well, no, what's liberating about this is, is I'm supposed to go to my parish. Right. So, you know, right. Like I, I go onto Google maps or whatever and like, which is the closest Catholic church right. to my house? And I, you know, I was like, I drove to that one and I like walked in the door and go, well, I guess this is where I'm supposed to be. Right. And that was like you say, I mean, it, it took a choice way. It took, it was l- very liberating to go I'm yeah. where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there doing what I'm supposed to do. And I'll tell you a great formula for success in life mm-hmm. is to be where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to right. be doing when you're supposed to be doing it. Right. Yeah. Like that, like you want to succeed in life, hit those three marks. Right. And it seems to me that if you want to succeed in the spiritual life and the eternal life, be where you're supposed to be doing right. what you're supposed to be doing when you're supposed to be doing it. 
And, you know, evangelicals can mock me all day long that that's a checklist approach to spirituality because I know it seems to me like doing the right thing. Well, and, and so, so in order, when I do this job for my friend, um, I'm expected to go to the weekly uh, planning meeting, right? And I can feel it in the air. And these are wonderful people. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I like these people. They're, they're, I can feel in the air. We need to, are we doing enough to make this good? Right. Are we, are we planning this enough? Like they were, they were talking about um, Lent the last time I did it, which was several months ago. And they were going to propose some things you could do for Lent if you wanted to participate in Lent, which was uh, uh, just voluntary. And they had several programs of fasting and whatever you could do. You could fast from food. You could fast this much or this much. You could fast from your electrical devices. You could whatever. And you give that up for the period of Lent. And and one of the uh, people in charge said, look, we got all these papers that we photocopied and we're going to make them here. We're going to do all this, blah, blah, blah. But I think like maybe six people are going to do this. And I thought, oh, I can just feel like if I was on that staff, I would be like, okay, what are we going to do to get people to do this? Get we, more people to do this. Get it. more people to do this. And so we can, uh, so, so we can make it a success. Right. And now, and, and, and the thought that I could uh, take the exit ramp here off this highway. Oh my gosh. And I got to tell you, you know, we'll, we'll kind of wrap this episode because this is going to be a good transition to the other thing we talked about at lunch, which was the difference between mission and vocation. Yeah. But, you know, I just got to tell you, it, it, it took like for, okay, if, if I've got any classic Protestants out there, right, you know, uh, this will really uh, irritate and anger some of them, <laughs> but right, like, so John Bunyan's, um, you know, classic Elizabethan novel, whatever, um, Pilgrim's Progress, yeah. right? And and the Pilgrim John has this this giant burden on his back, like all these like layered right. of, uh, I don't know, a big pile of stuff and weight. And at one point it just falls off and it becomes easier. And I mean, that's what it was like for me when I became Catholic is that you know, really experienced, I think, the reality of what Jesus said when he said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yeah. Wh which, by the way, implies that there is a yoke. <laughs> right. And there is a burden. Right. Uh, and that's to be where you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be yeah. doing when you're supposed to be doing it. But it's not hard. Right. Y right. You know, it's, it's, it's not. It, it's not right. It's something that that becomes very freeing in a way that I I really never experienced in the evangelical world. Yeah, I'm. A, I you you know you you introduced me as Ed the Protestant. For those who might not be terribly familiar with me and my participation here, but I have to say that I'm a little bit of a man without a country right now. I find myself in the Protestant service, even though there I was working for them and being up there in front and participating, thinking, Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you're like a this. stealth Catholic. You're like, you're like a. Right. Yeah. You're like, a, yeah. Well, hey, let's, uh, we're going to break now and we're going to stop the recorder and restart right. again. And I, I want to kind of keep this conversation going and talk about the other thing we talked about lunch, which is the difference between mission and vocation. Good. Good. Thanks, Ed. Thank you for listening. My name is Greg Smith. And if you've enjoyed this podcast, would you please hit the like and subscribe buttons wherever you get your podcasts? And please share it with others. And if you're curious about the Catholic worldview and faith, the Church and its saints, or Catholic history, culture, and art, then visit consideringcatholicism.com. And email me to let me know what you think. Greg at consideringcatholicism.com. <laughs>